And tonight I want to talk about um, a spirituality of willpower and grace. And then next week I want to talk about a spirituality of anthropology of willpower and grace and our struggle for radical sobriety. Then the last day I want to talk about living in grace, the power of the resurrection. So just an apologetic note. Um, this is not going to be, although I, I, I'm going to take parts and I very much respect the literature of 12-step and addictions and so on, but this, this is going to be a spirituality thing. Next week I'm going to go into more some of the very human things about willpower and addictions and our struggles and so on. Um, but even there, more from an anthropological point of view. I will bring in insights from all kinds of 12-step programs because I think they're um, invaluable in what they've contributed to spirituality. In fact, Richard Rohr always says when they write the history of spirituality, America's contribution is going to be 12-step programs and so on. Um, but tonight we will look at willpower, um, the movement from willpower to grace, the spirituality of willpower and grace. Okay, this is kind of moving very slowly, but I, maybe it's not moving at all. Okay, <laughs> oh, no, it is. Okay, okay. Um, I want to begin with a quote from St. Paul. And I'm going to come back to St. Paul later on in, in, in the second part of this lecture. St. Paul in the letter to the Romans, which is the most important thing he ever wrote, and the last thing he ever wrote, he said, woe to me, wretched that I am, he said, the good I want to do, I can't do, and the evil I want to avoid, I end up doing. It's kind of like a little hermeneutic. Um, anybody who is morally sensitive and morally honest will know that's also true for every one of us. You know, that so many times in life you're going to see we can't actualize ourselves. You know, the good we want to do oftentimes we just don't have the strength to do it or the time or circumstance and so on. And in oftentimes, too, the evil we want to avoid, um, we, we end up doing. Okay. And um, so I want to talk about our propensity to live by willpower rather than by grace and our habitual struggles to do so. And I want to begin with two stories. Okay. First one from Scripture, and then I'm going to call a clear-headed priest, a stunned apostle. Okay. Um, you know, when you read the, 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 the Scripture account, which is one of the great stories in many great stories in the gospel, but the story of the rich young man. He comes up to Jesus, and remember Jesus gives him this invitation to leave everything and follow him, and he can't do it. And then the scripture says he went away, and he went away sad because he was very rich. Now notice also he didn't go away bad. We've always villainized this young man. No, he's, he, he was a good rich, sad young man, came to Jesus, he goes away as a good, rich, sad young man. So he doesn't lose anything. Um, but then, Jesus turns to the apostles and he says this, he says, I tell you truly, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, sometimes you hear a cute homily on that, which is cute and accurate, but not this text. <laughs> okay. So sometimes people will tell you, you know, a needle was also the name of a gate in Jerusalem. And if a camel had nothing on its back, it could actually crawl through there. But if either it had a saddle or anything, it couldn't go through. So they said that the object, you know, we have to get rid of our riches and so on. Um, that's not what Jesus is saying, you know. And you get it by the disciples' reaction. Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And Peter says to him, if that's the case, it's impossible. Notice he didn't say it's difficult. He said, well, if that's the case, this is really difficult. He said, if that's the case, it's impossible. And Jesus says, you're right. It is impossible for human beings, but it's not impossible for God. Any of you who have been in 12-step programs, you'll know exactly what that means. It's impossible for an addict to give up an addiction. The rest of us, it's impossible for you to give up a bad habit, you know, on your own, but it's possible. It's possible through grace and community, and actually community is part of grace, you know. It's interesting, Jesus there, he, <laughs> he lauds Peter's answer. He doesn't say, Peter, well, for God's sake, you're, wake up and don't despair here. He said, no, that's good, you're right. It is impossible, but it's not impossible for God. Now, the clear-headed priest, <laughs> okay, in contrast. I'm going to tell you a story here. The story is, is strong. 
you're all adults, okay? Uh, but it's highly illustrative. And it's a good story. It's a story with a very happy ending. But some years ago, I was doing a priest's retreat to a large archdiocese. And when you do a priest's retreat, you always start on Monday night or Monday around noon or something. And then you go to the week. But on the Tuesday night after the talk, five of the priests came to me. They said, we're meeting in our support group tonight. Come and join us. So I did. And they went into a breakout room, and they had some scotch and some beer and some finger foods and so on. But they didn't get to them for about 45 minutes. And for the first 45 minutes before they got to the scotch and the beer and so on, they each, and they do this every week, they each made a searingly honest confession to, to the whole group of everything that they had done during the week, from their smallest humiliating details to big things. And then after when they were doing the scotch and the beer, the leader of the group told me, they said, you know, Father, he said, I, I formed this group five years ago. He said, we meet every week. And he said, we, we call ourselves a group for radical sobriety, even though none of us ever had a drinking problem, as they're drinking scotch and beers. <laughs> We're a group for radical sobriety. We'll look at that next week. Sobriety has little to do with a chemical. It's got more to do with honesty and transparency and so on than it has to do with any chemical, okay? And he said, I found this group for five years ago. I said, for this reason, he says, because I was a good priest, but I wasn't a great priest. And I can give you the reasons for both. He said, I was a good priest. He said, I went to the seminary. I was sincere. He said, no, I, I tried to study as hard as I could. And he said, uh, I went through the seminary, said and then I was ordained, said and then first I was assistant in a, in a par city parish, said, and then when I was still very young, the bishop gave me five rural parishes, which was way too much work. He said, but you know something? He said, I did it. He said, I, was, I, I literally killed myself doing this work. He said, I just completely laid myself out for the people. He said, you know, and, and they loved it. They said, they thought I was Francis of Assisi, they thought it was the best thing to ever hit that area. And he said, and I did well. He said, I was a good priest, but he said, I wasn't a great priest. He said, and I'll tell you why I wasn't a great priest. He said, I was doing all this hard work. He said, but I had kept some of my <laughs> compensations. He said, three of them in particular. He said, first thing he says, you know, they said, this is how I handle all my tensions. He said, one of them was through um, anger and... Uh, Resentment. He said, I, was, I had a lot of resentments. I hated the bishop. He said, and also I would hate people or be really upset if they didn't go along with my programs and plans and so on. He said, so I, there was a lot of anger inside of me. He said, and secondly, he said, um, I handled it all, a lot of my tension, all that work by, but just distraction and an escalating lifestyle. He said, I was young, single, you know, without a support group. He said, so I, I just spent a lot of money on on good booze and good food and good vacations and every CD you could buy and every kind of gadget and phone and computer and so on. He said, so I didn't realize for a while that's, that's compensatory. He said, but that wasn't the most serious. So you know how I handled my detention of my celibacy? He said, I handled it through masturbation. He said, so I had no illusions that I was Mother Teresa. He said, I was this good priest, but I had these compensatory things. He said, and it, it began to change, he said, with my father's death. He said, my father was a wonderful man. He said, and he died. He said, I drove across the state to bury him. He said, and I was driving home. He said, I was praying in the car and I was crying. And I thought, my dad was a great man. So I want to be a son. He said, I'm going to be a great priest. No more compensations. He said, and I made this resolution, just this firm resolution. No more of any of this. He said, but I was naive. He said, I had to learn what alcoholics and other people learn that you can't change your life just by making a resolution. He said, I have to learn what they learn. You can only change your life through grace and willpower. You can't give up an addiction just because you see you're going to do it. I've counseled alcoholics. One guy said, he says, I, my, my vows kept getting stronger. I put a hand on the Bible and swear I'd never drink again. Then I put two hands on the Bible and <laughs> swear I'd never drink again. At one point, I had both hands, both feet, I'm kneeling in a chapel, and I'm not going to stick. He said, and two days later, I had a drink. You know, those of you who are in 12-step programs, you know what he's talking about. You can't just change your life through willpower, and yet so often we're trying to live through willpower, you know. And sometimes the stronger we are, the more we try to do this. You know, 
I'm a good, strong Christian. I'm my dad's son. And in my own case, my dad was one of the most moral men I've ever met on this planet, which was wonderful. But he also gave his kids, there's no reason you should ever make a mistake in your life. <laughs> you know? Um, so, so yeah, well, I can do this. I can do this. And, you know, sometimes we kind of can. So you see, um, second, I'm, I'm not keeping up with this here. Uh, it's on your sheet. So um, at a certain point, we realize the uselessness of resolutions. We realize, they you know, that the experience of like people in 12-step programs realize that you simply can't, as this young priest that he says, I realize I can't do this on my own. So he called his five closest or closest friends together, and now they all do it. Uh, and they say it's, it's the kind of like literally transformed their lives. You know, they said, we, we were good priests, but we're trying to become great priests. And I remember the youngest guy in the group, he says, you know, Father, he said, I just joined this group two years ago. And he said, doing this is the hardest thing I've ever done. He said, not the confession. That's easy, he said. But being 38 years old and trying to live like Mother Teresa, he said, that's hard. <laughs> okay. Um, now, um, Sometimes, even to a certain extent, we can, and then we suffer oftentimes with even a greater danger. And that is, you know, when, when, we, uh, when we're trying to live morality, we're trying to live Christianity by willpower as opposed to grace. I'm going to talk about grace in a few minutes. Oftentimes, it happens even when we're really strong and can pull it off. You know what happens? We fall into bitterness and we fall into what the older brother, the prodigal son. Remember the older brother? First of all, Luke 15, where that story is. Luke 15 has three parables in a row. The parable of the man with 100 sheep, one strays. The parable of the woman with two coins, she, 10 coins, she loses one. And the parable of a father. And he's got two sons. And he's trying to get him into the house. And he can't get him into the house. The old, the youngest son is off to a foreign distant land with prostitutes and drinking and so on. And he's out of the house. He comes back to the house at the end. But the older brother is equally out of the house, except he's out through anger. And notice what he says to his father. His father comes out and he says, you know, son, he, incidentally, that's, a, that's an incredible, beautiful text. You know, when, when the, the father comes out to meet the older brother, which was something a Jewish father in Jewish literature never happened, because when you read Jewish literature, including the Bible, the story is always about the youngest the youngest daughter, the youngest son, the old guy is disposable. But here he comes out and notice the first words he said to him, son. You know where else that's used? That's what Mary says to Jesus after he's been lost in the temple for three days. And she's an anxious mother. He comes back and says, son, my father and I have been worried about you. So it's soft, it's beautiful. He says, son. He says, uh, we have to rejoice because your brother is dead. He's alive. And he, this is what he says to his father. He says, I've been home all these years. I've done all the work. I've never disobeyed a single commandment. And you never gave me even a calf, to, you know, a goat for my friends. And here this guy goes off with prostitutes and drinking, and you give him the fatted calf. Now notice, he's been home. He's been doing everything right, you know. He said, I've been home. I've served you. I haven't committed any sins. I haven't strayed. Notice, every, all his, pardon me. All his actions are right, but all his energy is wrong. So, see, so often, and, and incidentally, I want to emphasize that, that is one of the occupational hazards for many of us in this room, you know, where we, <laughs> you know, we, we, we are living the gospel, and the danger is that we do it right, but then we resent others who aren't living it, and at a certain point, we do, our actions are right, but our energy's all wrong. I could go on on this, you know, and I'm a person that has to watch this in my own life, you know. I've been an older brother. I've stayed home, done the work, and so on. But then it's really easy to, you know, look at. Incidentally, you, you, you know what, what follows that parable or that encounter when Jesus says to Peter, it's impossible. He's, and Peter says, well, you know, we stayed home. We, we've been... We didn't walk away from you like this prodigal, like, like um, the rich young man. What are we going to get? And Jesus kind of teases him. He said, well, I'll tell you what. 
that's also for us is anybody who's given up and he gives five things, father, mother, spouse, children, houses, or lands for my sake is going to get a hundred of them in the next life, except fathers. Remember, because Jesus is a monotheist. You only have one father. He's in heaven. Okay. Remember, Jesus said, call nobody on earth your father. You have one father. Okay. But he said, you're going to get a hundred of everything, except there is a catch. And what's the catch? Well, in, in Mark's gospel, he doesn't tell you what it is. Mark's gospel, Jesus says, you'll get it, but not without tribulation. Thank you. <laughs> so Jesus said, you're going to get all this reward, but you won't enjoy it. Okay, that's helpful. Okay. But in Luke's gospel, he tells you why you're not going to enjoy it. He said, because your energy is going to be all wrong. And he tells that beautiful parable about the 11th hour workers, you know, where this guy goes out in the morning and he hires people at 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, noon, 3 o'clock, and then some, the last, you know, he hires only at 5 in the afternoon. They only work one hour. But remember then they all get the same pay. And the people who worked only one hour get the same pay as those who worked the full day. And then they're angry. They tell the owner, they said, this isn't right. We worked the whole day. We bore the heat of the sun, the expression said. Now, they only worked for one hour in the shade. It's not fair we get the same wages. And the master says, friend, son, that's Jesus talking to Peter, who's asked the question. It's the friend. He said, didn't you agree to this? And isn't it a wonderful wage? He said, are you angry and bitter because I am generous? It's quite a line. That's one of the occupational hazards of us good people in this room tonight. We're often angry and generous because, angry and, and bitter because God is generous. I'll give you an illustration. You know, I'm, I'm a priest and a celibate. And I always tell priests, you know what can ruin a priest's heaven? Imagine you're celibate your whole life. You come to heaven and the first person you meet is Hugh Hefner from Playboy. <laughs> and you say to God, how did he get in here? And God will say, friend, isn't heaven a great place? <laughs> okay. And those of you who are women, you're going to get up there and you do all this Christian stuff. And the first person you're going to meet is Stormy Daniels. <laughs> and you're going to say, now, how did she get in here? And Jesus will say, friend, didn't you agree to this? You know? See, that really teases out, you know, something. That's like, when we're living by willpower instead of grace. See, then we're making the effort, then we become resentful about those who aren't making the effort. I'm doing all this. I'm living as a celibate and so on. And so some comedian said, to, when Hugh Hefner died, he said, hard to believe he's going to a better place. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now, you know somebody who's fully living in grace. You know what Mother Teresa said when she probably met Hugh Hefner in heaven? She said, God, I'm glad you made it. I worried my whole life you wouldn't make it, you know. <laughs> See, when you're living in grace, they're, 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 to the extent that I'm bitter, I'm jealous, I'm angry, that means I'm doing the right things, but my energy's wrong. That I'm doing them through willpower, I'm not being empowered by grace. Okay, now, our need to live by grace. Okay, what is grace? Okay. I want to begin with a, with, with a line from John the Baptist. To me, that's, that's one of the great texts in Scripture that distinguishes grace from willpower. And it's this. They come to John the Baptist, and they say to John the Baptist, are you the Messiah? And John the Baptist said, I'm not the Messiah. He said, in fact, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal strap. And then he makes the contrast. He said, because he, he said, I baptize with water. And he baptizes with fire and the Holy Spirit. It's an interesting contrast. What does it mean? John the Baptist said, I baptize with water. He baptizes with fire and the Holy Spirit. This. Let's look at water and fire. What can you do with water? You can wash something clean. Imagine you find an old lamp in the sand on the shore someplace. You bring it home and you power wash it. You power wash it and now it's completely clean but you haven't changed anything. It's still the old lamp. Water can only wash you clean, but fire can melt it down. And see, fire can change shapes. Fire can transform. Water can only wash you clean. Now, 
take all the texts about John the Baptist in Scripture, and every one of them, he's water. Now, John the Baptist says, come to me and I can diagnose you. I can tell you exactly what's wrong with you, but I can't fix you. You know, it's one thing to see a doctor, and the doctor perfectly diagnoses your disease. If what can you do? Nothing. <laughs> now you're on your own. It's helpful. You know what you have, but there's no cure. Jesus not only diagnoses, he also offers you the prescription, the medication for the cure. See, John the Baptist says, you know, the difference between me and Jesus, I can tell you what's wrong with you, but I can't fix you. He can fix you, you know. So, because he goes by more than, see, willpower is something we do on our own. Interesting, this is a little footnote, especially for those who are academics in the room, you know. The last 50 to 70 years, but particularly the last 50 years in the academic world, at all levels, all universities, theology and stuff included, we have done the greatest work of deconstruction, intellectual deconstruction that's ever been done. And it's really valuable. Today, we can diagnose like never, ever before. Just a simple example, you know, when you go to Starbucks and have a cup of coffee, you know, they can tell you today from the person who grew it to every person exactly how much each person got and who got chipped and all this stuff, but, but nobody can fix that, <laughs> okay? See, we, we, we can deconstruct everything, but sometimes we can't even build a toilet, you know? It's one thing to, to and, and it's valuable, don't get me wrong. I mean, it's really valuable to deconstruct. John the Baptist was a deconstructionist. He said, you're all sinners, and you're all addicts, and there's a lot wrong with every one of you. And he said, I'm going to baptize you and, and to make you aware of your sin, but now I can't help you. But he's smart enough to say, go to Jesus. Jesus knows what's wrong with you, and Jesus can help you. See, I baptize with water. He baptizes with fire, you know, that, and see, grace is fire. Water is important. It's very important that we have good diagnosis, but that doesn't fix you. I know a prison chaplain, a priest friend of mine, he says, uh, today he said sometimes in prisons, he said, we bring in these psychologists that they're wonderful, and they'll work with the prisoners, and after a while, the prisoner will know exactly why they're dysfunctional, but it won't change their behavior. <laughs> See, now I know why I'm angry because my father and my mother loved my sister better than me and all this type of stuff. It doesn't change my behavior at all, okay? See, that's baptism by water. It's valuable. It's the first step. Jesus' grace changes you. Now, what is grace? Okay. I'm, I'm going to actually begin with, with, with the third part, the message of John's gospel, the importance of hearing Jesus pronounce our name in affection. Okay, some of you have heard this from me before, so I apologize if it's repetition, but it's important. You know, we have four Gospels, and, 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 and they're, they're, they're actually three of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which we call the Synoptic Gospels. They're, they're different, but they're, there's a lot of similarities. They do Jesus chronologically. It's kind of what we were raised on, the Jesus story, you know, the Annunciation, then the birth of Jesus, then his life with Joseph and Mary, and then he goes public, and eventually his crucifixion, and so on. So you have this chronology. But also, they write up Jesus from the point of view of his humanity. So that, you know, Jesus is God, but he's in human flesh, and they write up his humanity, the crucifixion, and eventually the resurrection. John's Gospel is written much later, and John's Gospel is just utterly different. Okay. He has no chronology and so on. He doesn't even mention the birth of Jesus and so on. But also, it's very important in John's Gospel, Jesus is God from the first line to the last line. Jesus is God walking around in human flesh. With very few exceptions, there's just no humanity to Jesus in, God's gospel, in John's Gospel, to the littlest detail. You know, when he comes up to Peter, to Philip, and he says, how many loaves and fish do you have? John has in brackets, he already knew. <laughs> okay. you know. And also, like in John's Gospel, the Passion's written up. They come to arrest Jesus. He stands up. They all fall over. You know, he's God. And he doesn't need Simon of Serene to carry his cross. He carries his own cross. And actually, John's Passion is written up. It's brilliant. Most of it is a, is a trial. And Jesus is on trial, seemingly. But it's written up in such a way that Jesus is on trial, but he's the only person not on trial. 
Pilate is on trial. The Jews are on trial. The people are on trial. You and I are on trial. Jesus is dead because God is never on trial. Okay. But anyway, Jesus is God from the first line. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word becomes flesh. So John, immediately, he doesn't have any Christmas story, story about Jesus being born and 12-year-old Jesus lost in the temple. He starts already the adult Jesus. You meet Jesus in John's Gospel. He's fully ready to go. And these are going to be the first words out of his mouth. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first words out of his mouth are a question. The disciples of John are looking at him out of curiosity. And Jesus looks at them and he says, What are you looking for? That's the hermeneutic to all of John's Gospel. Jesus is God, and he comes down and he says, What are you looking for? Okay. And they said, Where do you live? That's deep mystical terminology. They said, Where, where? Where, where, does, where is God? And he says, come, I'll show you. So the whole gospel, Jesus is going to show us where God lives. You know, and he says, and he's going to tell us, you know what we're looking for? We're looking for the way, the truth, the life, to be born again, to drink the water of life so we'll never have to drink again, to eat the bread of life so we'll never be hungry again, and he, to, to um, you know, have our, to tell the truth. I'm going to come back on this text next week or the week after, but very important in John, the, the question of truth, that Satan's the prince of lies, so if we never lie, we're going to see God, and so on. But so Jesus tells us in, in many abstract ways what we're looking for, but then he's going to put it into one image at the end of the gospel. And this used to be the end of John's gospel. He wrote chapter 21 later. Okay. And it's Easter Sunday in the morning, and Mary of Magdala goes to the tomb, and she's looking for the body of the dead Jesus. And when she gets there, she finds Jesus, but she thinks he's the gardener. She doesn't recognize him. You know the text. And then Jesus says to her, what are you looking for? He repeats the question that opened the gospel. What are you looking for? And then before Mary can say anything, he says to her, Mary. He pronounces her name in love, and he said she fell at his feet. John's gospel, it's a mystical gospel, he says, you know what? In this life, we are only looking for one thing. I mean, we're looking for a million things. But he said, ultimately, we're looking for one thing. We are looking to hear Jesus pronounce our individual name in love. Mary, Peter, Jennifer, Jack. You know, some years ago, I went on a retreat. Robert Michel, French-Canadian retreat director, retreat for priests. He was an older man, very spiritual, he began to retreat this way. He said, you know, you're priests. You've all made many retreats. He said, I'm going to try to make a very simple retreat for you. I'm going to try to teach you how to pray in a special way. He said, I want to teach you how to pray that sometime in your life. Maybe not this week. Maybe not even this year. But that sometime in your life, you can open yourself up in prayer so that you can hear God say to you, I love you. He said, because before that, your life will never be right. You'll be looking for this, and you'll be looking for that, and this will be missing, and that will be missing. You'll be restless here, and you'll be restless there. He said, only one thing. You need to hear God pronounce your name in love. If any of you are here from evangelical backgrounds, that is the evangelical religion. That is the very essence of evangelicalism, you know, where they say, have you met Jesus Christ? You know, most of us in... in <laughs> And in, in the other churches, mainline churches, we don't understand the question. So I said, have you met Jesus Christ? I said, God, I think so. I don't know. <laughs> okay. We, we don't know what the question means. A friend of mine, John Shays, he was teaching in Chicago and Loyola, and some young man asked him, evangelical, came up and says, have you met Jesus Christ? And John said, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> he, said, he said, and it has screwed up my entire life. Okay. Uh, see, that, that's the mainline Christian answer, you know. But we have something to learn from that. You know, that, that isn't the whole gospel, but that is a central part, and, and that's the essence of John's gospel. But charismatic, I mean, charismatic Christianity and evangelical Christianity is simply predicated on that. And we can learn from our evangelical brothers and sisters that, you know, that have you had that effective moment so that now you begin to live by grace, not by your own willpower? You know, you're going to see that, I'm going to tease that out with Jesus. Then you begin to live this out. So I'm living out not because I've got to obey rules, I want to be a good person, I want to please God, I want to please my dad, I want to please all this. No, then you're doing it out of love. 
There isn't any bitterness, you know. It's like a like a, a young mother who gets up to nurse her child, and she loves the child. She didn't get up with bitterness. I'm going to feed this brat. Probably some nights that's true, but anyway. Come. But she loves the child. You, you're doing it not out of willpower. You're doing it out of love, you know. And see, and that's what we have to bring ourselves to. Otherwise, unless I'm operating out of that in some way, and you don't have to have one effective moment the way, you know, Charismatics and evangelicals have, you know, um, well, that's Tim Tebow. When have you met Jesus Christ? But we, we have to have some sense of affectivity that Jesus isn't just the philosophy in our life, you know. I have no problem believing in Jesus as a moral teacher, as a philosopher, you know. I don't think there's anything anywhere. There is some depth in the depth of Buddhism and Hinduism, some of the great world religions, but nobody you know, I, I believe has brought God's moral code to this planet the way Jesus has with his Sermon on the Mount and, and, uh, and some of the things he's, he, he leads us towards, the deepest moral teaching. You have no doubt to believe this is godly and so on. Um, and his, 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 uh, his theology understood correctly of what it means to suffer and suffer for others and so on, which we often don't really understand and so on or understand properly. It's to me, there's no doubt Jesus was the greatest moral religious teacher ever. But that's very different than having Jesus as your friend. It's very different than having Jesus as your lover. It's very different than having Jesus as the effective center in your life. See, when there's, when there's no effective center whatsoever, then Jesus does become a philosophy, a very good one. Jesus does become a moral code, a very good one. Then we live it out by willpower. And if we're strong enough, we can do it. But then often we end up like the older brother, the prodigal son. We stay home and do all the work, and we resent everybody else and hate everybody else who isn't doing it. You know, all the action is right, the energy is wrong. Okay, now, I want to move to Jesus, then to, to Henry Nowen. Okay. You know, a very pivotal text in the Gospels is the baptism of Jesus. You know, now, John doesn't have it because John just immediately has Jesus as God. But in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they divide Jesus' life up into two parts, what we call Jesus' hidden life. So, you know, we historically we believe that Jesus was probably 30 years old when he went public. So what the first 30 years of his life, he was a carpenter in, in Nazareth. Okay. Then he goes public, but what moves him into his public life is his baptism. Okay. His baptism would be analogous today, almost like a seminary and being ordained, you know that now you begin a public ministry and so on. And the baptism texts are beautiful. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're all the same, just slightly different wording. But they're beautiful, powerful texts. And scholars will tell you, to really get the gospel of Jesus, you have to get that baptism text. And it works this way. They said, Jesus came to John in the desert, and he had himself baptized. He had himself a water baptism, you know, which actually scandalized some people because... You know, you went there to be baptized for your sins. So if he had let himself baptize, had he committed any sins and so on. But anyway, Jesus, remember we say, he became sin for us. So he had, submits to the water baptism. But then the way they describe the text is beautiful. It said, John immersed him in the water. And then when Jesus' head broke the water, that's a powerful image of birth. See, he's being reborn. When a baby comes out of its mother's womb, the head of the baby breaks the mother's water. Incidentally, we needed feminine scripture scholars to, before we understood that. <laughs> okay. men, men didn't know that. As soon as we had some women scripture scholars said, you know, this is a powerful metaphor for birth. The baby's head, and, and they, they put it, they broke his head, broke the water. You know? Then as his head is emerging, the voice from heaven, God's voice says, this is my beloved, my blessed one. The Greek word beloved, blessed, this, this is my Blessed one, in whom I am well pleased, or in whom I take delight. So it's, uh, you know, this, is, this is my blessed one. You know, scholars will tell you that helps form Jesus' consciousness. See, so that um, you, you can't understand Jesus' message. Imagine this. It's as if for the rest of his life, Jesus is hearing, I'm the beloved. I'm the blessed one. And that's why he can look out and say, blessed are you when you're poor. And blessed are you when you're meek. And blessed are you at all kinds of your life. See, you're blessed. 
That's an incredible thing to do. You need a blessed consciousness to do that. And most of us don't have a blessed consciousness at all. We have a cursed consciousness. See, the opposite of blessing is a curse. You know, and a curse is not what comes out of your mouth when you slice your golf ball wrong. That's just colorful language. Or you get caught in traffic and now you're going to be late. You are saying things, that's not a curse. <laughs> Kids come to confession and say, Father, I cursed and I swore. I, I always think, uh, you use some colorful language, that's not cursing and swearing. And besides, I'm going to say something I shouldn't say. I, I'd like to tell them that besides, that's not a Catholic sin. That's only a, that's only a Protestant sin, you know. <laughs> okay. In fact, there's whole Catholic cultures couldn't, couldn't speak if they weren't swearing almost all the time. <laughs> go to Ireland, go to Quebec, go to Italy, go to France. And so that's part of the Catholic ethos, sad. <laughs> for better or for worse, is a lot of cursing and swearing, you know. Okay, that's not a curse. This is a curse. Imagine a little kid in a high chair, two years old and or a year and a half old and the kid eats and then the you know, kids when they eat they fuel up and the kid starts shouting and throwing jello around the room and the adult says, shut up, stop that. That's a curse. And that's a lot more pernicious than what you do what, and harmful that comes out of your mouth when you slice your golf ball wrong. You have just shut down life. You know, if you go back to the, the original blessing where God makes the earth and they say, no, he said, let there be light and light separated from darkness. And God thought it was good, good. And all this energy, God blessed his thoughts. Good, very good, you know. See, the reason we say, shut up, stop that. Notice, first of all, notice the irony in that. That's probably the first joy you've seen all day. And you shut it down, you know. Basically, you're saying, you know, we're not going to have joy in a house of depressed adults. So stop it, you know, <laughs> you know. And of course, little kids have great resiliency. A minute later, they're doing it again. Said, I thought I told you to shut up, you know? Okay. Now, if you could play your life back as a video, you would see just the countless times as a young person, and sometimes even as an old person, where your energy has been shut down and shamed. Stop it. Shut up. Don't eat like a little pig, and so on. Who do you think you are? Those are all massive curses. And they form our consciousness. Then when we look out, we don't see blessed are you. We say, cursed are you. Except we say it this way. Who does she think she is? He thinks he's so smart. That guy's an idiot. He's a jerk. That's all cursing. You know, look, my brother has a joke on this. <laughs> he says, was a, a grandfather. And he used to take his granddaughter, she was four years old, out for ice cream every Saturday morning. He'd take her out for ice cream. And she liked this. But one Saturday morning, he couldn't take her out, so Grandma took her out for, for ice cream. So they came back and they said to the little girl, well, how was it with Grandma? She said, well, it, it wasn't as much fun. I said, it's more fun with Grandpa. He said, because Grandma's so nice, she just smiles at everybody. Grandpa points out who the jerks are and the idiots, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of Grandpa inside of us, you know. <laughs> she thinks he's so smart, this guy's a jerk, and so on. See, that's our Christ Notice that's the very opposite of Jesus. See, we're not having any sense of grace, no sense that I'm loved, you know? See, we're operating out of our sense of not being loved. You know, brings me to Henry Nouwen. Now, Henry Nouwen is one of the great spiritual figures of our age, of our time, you know? But Henry was always a project. He was a saint, and one of the things what, what makes him so intriguing to us, he was a saint with all of our struggles and he'd hang those struggles just out for all the public to see, you know. Um, and it, it's interesting, he was a man of great achievement. He wrote 60 books. He taught at Harvard, at Yale. He turned down teaching jobs at Harvard and Yale and Notre Dame and so on. And he had friends all over the world and was so renowned. But the first person said, for almost his entire life, he said, I just suffered. He said, because I, I couldn't receive love. He said, it just went through me like a sieve. He said, I couldn't hold it. He, had, he said, I, with all this adulation and love was coming, he said, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't hold it. I would just let it go. And several times he'd go into clinical depression. He'd check himself into a clinic for clinical depression, actually with some of his finest books in clinics and so on. But he said, I, I just couldn't hold this. He said, I was like a bottomless well, that no amount of love or affirmation. He said, I just, I'd feel good for a minute like a drug, and then it would just, you know, and he'd sometimes get off the stage and he'd 
And, and he was really powerful on stage. He got off the stage and he sat down and he began to sob. And he says, nobody loves me. And someone says, well, Henry, the whole world loves you. Then later on in life, he left Harvard and he went with Jean Vanier to France and then spent the rest of his life working with severely um, young kids and adults with, with disabilities. So then he lived the last years of his life with people who didn't know he was famous, couldn't care if he was famous, you know, couldn't sometimes put three sentences together and you know something, he found love. Finally, with people who, with all these severe mental disabilities, he said, finally, I, I could receive love. And then his last years, when he wrote some of his finest books, all his books have one major motif, and he's preaching, just saying, you're God's beloved. You are God's loved one. And if you can receive that, if you can ever just, because we are, God is loving us incredibly right now, except <laughs> we don't know it, so we're trying to live out of willpower. And he said, as soon as you get this, said, you, you, you can just live out of love. It's an incredible fire in your life. So all the marvelous books he wrote, but the, his last books always have just this one theme. You're God's beloved. You're God's loved one. You know, and if you, as soon as you realize that, your whole life is going to change. You won't have to look for adulation. You won't have to look for achievement. He said, it's, just, it's inside of you. Those of you come from, from Protestant traditions where you were taught, you know, and which is a very rich theology, right, from Luther. It was, the, it was the, what drove Martin Luther, but the whole idea of justification. We Catholics have never so much developed that motif, but the whole idea is that it comes from St. Paul. St. Paul said, we're always trying to boast. But boasting doesn't mean bragging. He said, we're trying to boast. It. You're trying to boast with your life, which means we're always trying to do something to leave a mark. You know, remember the expression, have a child, plant a tree, write a book, win a Super Bowl, do something that your name's going to be forever engraved. And we're always trying to chase that, to give ourselves significance, to give ourselves substance, and we can't do it. You can't do it. It's, it's just the bottomless well that's now and found out. You know, only God can do it for us. Paul said, don't boast. God will do it for you. You know, the, the beautiful text that we just read today at, at Mass, <clears throat> where Jesus sends the disciples out in pairs for their first missionary experience. And when they come back, it's described in Mark's Gospel. Mark said they came back, said, and they were full of the Holy Spirit. They were full of fire. And they said, you know, we cast out demons and we heal people. And Jesus said, that's wonderful. But he said, don't rejoice so much in your successes. Rejoice in the fact that your names are written in heaven. See, God has you firmly locked in your radar screen. God loves you. I use Henry Nouwen because he's such a perfect example. Henry Nouwen did all this achievement and he just didn't do it for him. And then finally, when he was loved by people who didn't know he did any achievement whatsoever, he realized, I'm loved. And all his last book were books written out of grace in that magnificent kind of last book he wrote on the return of the prodigal son is one of the great books on grace that's been written, you know. Um, anyway, that's, that, that's grace. Now, well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's five minutes to eight. Um, I'm going to stop at this point. And, uh, and maybe we'll do about five or ten minutes if you have any reactions or questions. Then we'll do our break. Because I want to talk in, in the second part about our struggle for grace. How we have to struggle to try to get there. But at this point, I want to stop. We have two runners here, Sister Ha and, 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 and uh, Raymond. If, if people have questions or reactions, you want to... Thank you. Um, Pope Francis speaks of that we have rediscovered the centrality of the kerygma as fundamental in the Christian formation. In fact, he says, all Christian formation is the deepening of the kerygma, yeah. which is really the, the proclamation that you just gave of, you know, the love of God and, yeah. and, and God's unconditional love which should be the center of our evangelizing activity. And however, it, we still confuse the kerygma with catechesis, with formation, with philosophy and theology. So uh, 
how can we bring this back into parish life? And, um, that's, that's yeah. Th thank you for the question, a very good question. Um, I want to say two things about it. First, before the parish life, and that is we, we need to precisely understand the kerygma for what it is, you know. Uh, let me start quite simply. You know the word gospel. We say the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. We misunderstand the word gospel. The gospel isn't, doesn't mean good advice. It means good news. See, there's a, this is the good news <laughs> according to Mark. This is the good news. So the gospels are, first of all, the kerygma is the announcement of good news. It's not the announcement of a moral code or how you should live. That comes up. But they're saying, these are, this is how God loves us. You know, um, we're going to look at that in, later on in these sessions, you know. As Richard Rohr always says, you know, as a Christian, there isn't a single thing you can do to make God love you more. And there isn't a single thing you can do to make God love you less. God is love. And see, and that's the good news. Um, and we get that far after the coffee break. And we get to Paul where Paul says, there's just, that's the ultimate news that we're just in these wonderful, loving hands. That, and, and, you know, I think the first mistake we make is somehow we've turned the gospel into a teaching. We've turned the gospel into a catechesis. We've turned the gospel into a moral code, and which it is, but it's not first and foremost. First, it doesn't say the teachings of St. Mark or teach according it's the good news. It's good news. And see now, to get it to a parish level, this, this is not so much, even so much as a strategy, although there's strategy involved in it. This is a tonality, you know. And see, Francis has been trying to change the church, not in its teaching, in its tone. So Francis says, I want the church, and, he, and he's very clear on his agenda. He says, I want the church that puts a merciful face to God's mercy. Remember, asked me, a journalist asked me once, said, is Francis just trying to make the church look good? I said, no, he's trying to make God look good. You know, see, Francis says, I want a church for, that's, that's merciful and a church that's for the poor. He said, I want a church of the poor, for the poor, but I want a church to put, a church that puts God's merciful face on, you know, which, you know, we, we've had lots of strengths in our churches. Recently, that hasn't been so much. Uh, uh, certainly in Roman Catholicism, I, I'm a cradle Roman Catholic, Sometimes I've looked across the benches at the evangelical and say, God, they're, they're, they're putting a, a more merciful face to God than we are, you know. Um, see, so it's not so much, Antonio, the, the strategy, you know, how is the catechesis going to happen. It's a tone. It's a coloring, you know, that we're announcing good news, you know. And, and I want to say, after it's hard, you know, like we're people and we're tired. We have our own problems. It's hard for me to go up to every time I say Mass and say, this is really good news. And sometimes the scripture texts don't even sound like good news. <laughs> no, really, sometimes you read a scripture text and instead, reader, instead of saying, this is the word of the Lord, the reader should say, this is the word of the Lord? <laughs> Remember a few years ago in our chapel, we read a text and King David, um, God had told him, for whatever reason, you're not supposed to do a census. So King David decides, I'm going to do a census. And God gets extremely upset. And then to punish King David, he kills 30,000 people, but not King David. He said, this is the word of the Lord. Okay. <laughs> okay. See, <laughs> but the whole thing, it's good news. And God is merciful. God is love. And, you know, that's always got to be the backstop, the canopy, the deep root out of which we come. See, then the rest will follow. Then we'll put the right face to it. Um, and strategy, we need catechetical and liturgical conferences. You know, these people also have to make a living and, uh, and how we should do that. Okay. Other... Okay, well, I'll tell you what, it's... It, why don't you take a 12-minute coffee break? <laughs> 13 if you're, if you're really libertine. Okay. Okay, we've been looking at the, you know, what is grace? You know, as opposed to, I think you've got the idea, 
we can live our lives just out of our willpower. And if you're strong enough, you can do it. Most of the time, we, we can't really do it fully. But then even when we do it, the danger is we're, because of our effort, we grow angry, our energy's wrong. And the whole idea is you need to live it out of love. We say like, like Jesus, the whole idea that he, he heard his father say to him, I love you, you're my special one, you know, and you would take delight. And because of that, he could take delight in other people. It's an energy. It's, it's a flow of life that you can participate in. Now, I want to talk about the struggle for grace. Okay, and I want to take, I want to use Luke's gospel. Okay, not, because just Luke's gospel is so clear. And, and, and to begin with this, Luke's gospel is preeminently the gospel of prayer. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is shown to pray more than all the other gospels totaled. You know, in Luke's gospel, Jesus prays a lot. And it's the only gospel we have Sometimes they, Luke describes internally what's happening to Jesus while he's praying. We're going to look at one of those texts and so on. You don't get that in the other Gospels. Um, and it's also, it's interesting, in Luke's Gospel, it's the only Gospel where they ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. See, in the other Gospels, Jesus teaches us the Our Father, but he has to volunteer the lesson. At a certain point, he has to say, I'm going to teach you how to pray. In Luke's Gospel, they come to say, we want to learn how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And there's a reason for that. And it's this, that in Luke's gospel, uh, the disciples see the effects of grace operating in Jesus' gospel, uh, in Jesus' life, um, in, in a special way. You know, the, the disciples of Jesus, they notice that Jesus is n different than they are. And he's different not because he can do miracles or walk on water or whatever and so on. They were intrigued with him because he could actually live what he taught. Jesus could love and forgive an enemy, which they thought was impossible. So Jesus says, love your enemies, forgive those who persecute you. If someone slaps you, turn the other cheek. If someone steals your coat, give them your cloak as well. And they realized, we can't do that. And they realized he could. See, so they saw something in Jesus, and that's why they say, teach us to pray. And they sensed it was coming from his prayer life. They sensed that, that inside of Jesus, when he was connecting to God and his prayer life, he was drawing a strength that they didn't have, grace. You know, they sensed it. They didn't have the word for it. They sensed he was living by grace. Okay, now, that's Luke's gospel. But then Luke is really clear that at the key point of his life, Jesus is going to be put severely to the test. Okay, and that's that powerful text in the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay. Uh, that text is also written up in Matthew and Mark, what we call the agony in the garden, okay? Let me just talk a little bit about that text, period. The agony in the garden, we call it, okay? I want to emphasize two words before I get more deeply into the text. First is the word agony, okay? Um, and then I'll look at, at garden. You know, the word agony in Greek, agonia, it didn't refer to agony the way we refer to it today in English. You say, you know, the agony and the ecstasy. Some, you, know, you, you can have agony in your life, you know, or you can have ecstasy in your life. And agony, you're sweating blood, as Luke describes it. But that was a technical term, and it was a technical term for athletes. You know, the Olympic Games existed at the time of Jesus. And what athletes would do is they would warm their bodies up for the contest. You know, today athletes do it too, except they have professional masseuses and so on. You don't have somebody who just walks out of a dressing room at the Olympics and runs the 100 meters. He'd finish last. You know, she'd finish last. See, they, they warm their muscles. They loosen them up. They get massage. And so, they, so they're really warm. When they get there to run, they're ready. Now, Luke says Jesus is getting ready for a great test, the ultimate Olympics. And he goes into an agonia. Except his agony, instead athletes, they worked themselves to a lather of sweat. You know, he worked himself, Luke said, he began to sweat blood. So he's working himself up for some mental test. And what's the test? Okay. Well, <laughs> little footnote, it, it's tipped off by the word garden. Notice it's the agony in the garden. It's not the agony in the temple, the agony in a boat, agony on a mountain, agony in the desert. You know, in, in, in the Gospels, by and large, geography is more than geography. It's very important. Where something happens is very important for your interpretation of what was there. So, for instance, 
if something happens in a boat in the New Testament, that means that's something to do with church. The church is a boat. If something happens in a mountain, it's to do with revelation. If something happens in deserts, it's to do with temptation and so on. But what are gardens? In all archetypal literature, including scripture, gardens have nothing to do with vegetables, cucumbers, garlic, radishes, okay. Gardens are where lovers go. See, it's the agony of a lover, okay. Incidentally, as a footnote, would that Mel Gibson had understood that before he made that movie, The Passion of the Christ. Yeah. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen the, the movie The Passion of the Christ, okay. That's a great work of art. It's not a great work of theology. It's a very good work of art. Mel Gibson's an artist, okay. Got theology wrong, but he got the art right, okay. You know, what did Mel Gibson choose to emphasize in that movie? The physical suffering of Christ, you know, which must have been pretty horrific. So what's wrong with that? What, what's wrong with emphasizing the physical suffering of Christ? Well, just simply this, that's exactly what the Gospels don't do. The Gospels have pains to write out the physical suffering of Christ. Sometimes one line, they had him scourged, led him away and crucified him, bingo. No, not 22 minutes of scourging and so on, because that's not what they want you focused on. This is not Jesus, the physical athlete. This is Jesus, the moral athlete, you know. See, in his test is it, this, you know. Um, keep your, okay. First of all, Luke emphasizes okay, it's Jesus the lover who's suffering here. Not Jesus the high priest, not Jesus the mediator, it's not Jesus the magus, you know, it's, it's G, or G, Jesus the great king. He's suffering as a lover. Because Jesus preached love, and then first of all, uh, the, there's beautiful imagery. Luke is emphasizing that he's a stone's throw from everybody. They said they went into the garden, he left his disciples, then he withdrew a stone's throw from them. How far is that? Okay, that's a metaphor. You know, I understood that text not in the scripture class. It was once when did see a man dying in, in palliative care at a hospice. And this man said, he said, you know, Father, he said, I have a wonderful wife and kids, and they hold my hand every minute. He said, but I'm a stone's throw from everybody. I'm going into this alone. See, there, there's, there's a, an isolation that they're talking about. Okay, no. And... Then they emphasize his disciples are asleep. Now, in Luke's gospel, uh, it's not even so much that they're physically asleep. They might have been, and if they if they are, there's good reason for it. You know, they've just had a three-hour dinner and drank five cups of wine. It's midnight. I don't like their chances. Okay. <laughs> but Luke said they were asleep out of sheer sorrow. They were they were too depressed. And they were too blinded to the lesson. So they what they were asleep to, not just Jesus praying, they were asleep to his message. They were asleep to his inner to their own inner identity. They were, they were asleep to grace. You know? That you know, a lot of times we're asleep out of sheer sorrow. Incident that's what's happening to our church right now with this, the clerical sexual abuse crisis. We're all going asleep out of sheer sorrow. There's no way of facing all of this. So we don't. You know, but inside of that, we lose a message. We lose our, our inner identity and so on. Now, what's his struggle? Okay. Um, and this is the inner essence of struggle. You know, in Jesus, we always, we tend to get this wrong. I shouldn't say always. We always think when Jesus is in the garden and he's on the ground, he says, Father, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. We always think he's making this decision. Should I die or not die? Should I die or should I evoke divine power and, you know, escape the situation? That's not the decision he's making. He's a dead man, okay? He's going to die. The question is more, how am I going to die, okay? And am I going to die in bitterness, in anger, in coldness, in unforgiveness, or am I going to die in love? Am I going to die in forgiveness? See, so, in fact, that's the ultimate moral choice we make every day of our lives, and most times, three or four times a day, you know. You know, it's not a question, are you going to be insulted on a given day? Are you going to be taken for granted? Are you going to get a cold shoulder? It's only a question of how are you going to react? With bitterness, screw you too, or with forgiveness? See, that's the ultimate moral drama. 
That's the drama of the lover. A lover, we're, we're all lovers, and we're meeting affirmation, we're meeting affection, we're meeting graciousness, and we're also meeting bitterness and coldness and rejection and so on. And so that every day we're choosing, and ultimately we have to choose hugely in our life. Am I going to be a person of bitterness, anger, or am I going to be a person of graciousness and forgiveness? So, see, that's what Jesus is choosing. And what you have in the garden, that's why it's written up as a struggle. He is desperately clinging to his father because he knows if he lets go, if he lets go and steps out of grace, then he's going to become angry. He's going to become bitter. He's going to become self-pitying. He's going to become all the things we, we become, you know. See, and so he's clinging to his father like a, like a, like a man who's going to drown clinging to a rope. But he was clinging to his father. He's clinging to love and forgiveness and so on. He's clinging to grace. You're the same as I am. When I try to live my life by willpower, I can't forgive it, a coldness. I can't love an enemy. I can't forgive somebody who will kill me. Jesus could. In grace, we can do it. Remember, Peter said, if that's the case, it's impossible. Jesus, it is impossible for you. It's not impossible for God. You know, when Jesus is dying, he's forgiving the people who are killing him. You know, how is that possible? Because he's doing it out of grace. When we do it out of willpower, we're not. You know, how can we forgive somebody? Incidentally, as, a, as an aside, to me, that is the litmus test of Christian morality. You know, oftentimes, I don't even like the expression, but a few years ago, there were, everybody was trying, what are these litmus tests, you know? What makes you a Christian? And usually they single out one moral issue, abortion. That's the litmus test. Are you a Christian or not? No, it's not a moral issue. This is the litmus test. Can you love and forgive an enemy? Can you love somebody who kills your daughter? Can you love somebody who's killing you? See, that's where Jesus takes us further than any other moral teacher. And you can only do that through grace. Humanly, you can't forgive somebody who's torturing you. Um, Jesus is facing the tortures, and he says, can, can I resist? Can I resist hatred and violence? Can I forgive my persecutors? Can I forgive the good thief? Can all this pain and humiliation bring me to a deeper compassion rather than a bitterness? Can I stay awake to my inner identity, you know, as God's beloved? You know, a cute little text you know, because Scripture is full of wonderful archetypes. But um, right after Jesus finally passes this test, he hangs on to grace and he says, Father, your will be, will be done. I'm going to die and I'm going to forgive the people who did this to me, you know. Then he gets up, finds his disciples asleep, okay. Um, they wake up and then they come to arrest him and immediately Peter pulls out his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. And it's interesting, Jesus only loses his temper twice in Luke's gospel, and this is the first time. Because Luke has a very gentle Jesus. Jesus says, enough. Put the sword away. You know, he's telling Peter, he says, Peter, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> you know? Well, he said, I spend my whole life fixing ears. <laughs> okay? And the night before I die, you cut one off, which is a sure sign you didn't get it. <laughs> no, Jesus is preaching his whole life, but nonviolence and he's healing people's ears and everything else and so Peter's last thing is he cuts a guy's ear off which you know Peter was asleep that's what Luke said he was asleep out of sheer sorrow and when when we're being persecuted and and, and, we're, and we're depressed and so on we're asleep and out of sheer sorrow and then we cut people's ears off and so on and uh, we're living by willpower okay and that's interesting the last line they said then an angel came and strengthened him. Now I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to use Texas terminology. Why in the hell didn't the angel come earlier? <laughs> you, know, you know, you have this thing in Scripture. <laughs> Just after the, it's, it's done, then the angel comes. The angel had been very useful about 10 minutes earlier, you know. <laughs> no, but there's something, the same as Jesus after his temptations. After his temptations, then the angel comes and strengthens him. Well, I gave you that quote earlier from Trevor Harriet, where he says, um, well, it's on the, other, the previous slide, he says, only after the desert has done its work in you can an angel come and strengthen you. 
The angel can only come when you give up your own power. See, the angel's there all the time, but we don't let the angel in. You know, see, we're, as long as I'm still trying to do it, I can't be helped. And again, those of you who work in 12-step programs, you know that. As long as you think you're still in control, um, you, you're not going to let yourself be helped. It's when you finally give up that grace can flow in, you know. It's like a little kid who's fighting his mother. He wants to do this and he can't do it. And finally, when he gives up, the mother can do it for him, you know. See, God can work in us, but not when we're fighting God off, you know. See, so it's, it's not that the angel doesn't want to come, wants you to do it yourself. Quite the opposite. As long as I'm trying to do it myself, the angel can't come in because I'm not letting the angel in. Okay, one last thing and then we'll, we'll have some questions. And that is, I want to talk a little bit about the constellations of grace. Great line from Gandhi, who was a Hindu. It's interesting. Gandhi was a Hindu, but he always carried a New Testament in his, in his, in his backpack. And he says, the gospel of Jesus is the greatest bhakti yoga ever written. See, bhakti yoga is the spirituality for lovers. And, and Gandhi said it's the greatest, uh, you know, spirituality of love that's ever been written spiritually, you know. But he says this. He says, when I despair, I remember that all through history, the way of truth and love has always won. There have been murderers and tyrants, and for a time they seem invincible, but at the end they always fall. Think of it, always. It's a resurrection text. Now, like I said, this is grace. We're struggled to get there, but what are the consolations of living in grace? This. First of all, we don't have to get it right, and we don't have to attain perfection. And I want to give you Paul's farewell speech. Scholars agree that Romans 8 is really Paul's farewell discourse. I mean Romans, in particular chapters 1 to 8. The, the following chapters are directed more to the Jewish community and how they can understand themselves in, in the light of Christ since they haven't accepted Christ. Okay, But if, if, if Paul was this great, great missionary, okay, the greatest missionary ever, okay, we're Christian today because of St. Paul. Okay, So now he's in Rome. And <laughs> he's going to die. And this is kind of his farewell song. Okay. And Romans 1 to 8, it's a very interesting book. Paul does it this way. Kind of, you know, okay, great missionary. What's your farewell song? He starts this way. He says, he spends seven and a half chapters telling you that you can't get it right. And nobody ever got it right. He said, you know something? We're sinners. And nobody has ever got their lives right. The Jews had the law and they couldn't obey it. And the Gentiles had nature and that the law written in nature and that their own humanity and they couldn't follow that so that the Jews couldn't get it right, the Gentiles couldn't get it right, and then you couldn't get it right. And he says, and he himself can't get it right. That's when he said, woe to me, wretch that I am, the sin I want to avoid I end up doing, the good I want to do I can't do. We're just morally inept. And so he puts this almost like a an opera with it's working to crescendo. You can't get it right. You can't get it right. There isn't a single thing you can do to make God love you. But he's working up to crescendo in chapter 8. And that's what he said. And the good news is you don't have to. You can't get your life right, but you don't have to. That's that incredible text that says, nothing can separate you from God's love. Neither principalities, demons, ideologies, religions, people who hate you, even your own weakness. You know, nothing can separate you from God's love. So the bad news is you can't get your life right. The good news is you don't have to. You know, we are loved by God unconditionally in ways we, we can't ever believe. Incidentally, that is why Christians don't believe in reincarnation. You know, it's interesting. At any given time, over half the world believes in reincarnation. Okay? Three groups don't. Christians, Jews, and Muslims because we have the same God. And our God is a redeeming God. So we believe you only need one lifetime because you don't have to get it right. <laughs> because this God loves you and God will do it for you. See, if I'm a Hindu, I'm a Taoist, I'm, I'm a Buddhist and so on, those are great religions. Those are great religions. And at the end, they were trying to lead you to the same place Christianity is. They're leading you to compassion and so on. They're leading you to 
ultimately inside the body of Christ and so on. But the trouble is they're not religions of grace, and so you have to do it. And if you don't get it right, you have to come back and do your life over. And if you don't get it right the second time, you come back and do your life the third time. And it's like when you were little kids and the teacher was teaching you to write between the lines. You just have to do the exercise over and over till you can stay between the lines. In Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism, the great religions, you got to get it right. Paul says, Christians, we don't have to get it right. We just have to give it. We just have to let grace flow into our lives. And God can do for us what we can't do for ourselves. At this stage, I've got to quote my colleague, Tom Singer, who many of you know. Tom's great line, he always goes up to people and says, do you believe in reincarnation? And of course, Christians say no. And Tom says, it's your first time here, is it? Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's the first, we don't have to get our lives right. Um, okay. Uh, see, and we can live beyond measured prudence, rest the gospel. Um, you know what, one of the, I'm going to come back on that the third week and next week for, as well. Um, see, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a curious thing. It works to the degree that you work it. Those of you who are in 12-step in, in programs, I'd say, the program works if you work it. If you don't work it, it's not going to work. Christianity isn't a philosophy. Christianity, if you work it, it works. You know, and it's going to work to the exact degree that you trust it. If you're as radical as Mother Teresa and just believe it, absolutely, it works for you, absolutely. If you're half-baked the way I am, it kind of works half-bakedly. <laughs> you know, but, but see, so that... Um, uh, See, grace works, but only the degree that you work at. You have to let it into your life. It has to be transformative. Like Jesus said, it's yeast. You know, the, 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 but except as though we can resist. Okay. Now, I want to end with this one because I take some questions. But also with grace, inside of grace lies the ultimate consolation inside of grace, grace and that's the famous thing about Christ is sent into hell. Okay. I want to talk about that. You know, in all religions, not just inside of Christianity, and I want to say this confidently, in all religions, this is the greatest consoling doctrine that exists. And I don't think we ever picked up on it, you know. You know, in, in, in the creed, we say, he descended into hell the third day he rose again from the dead. What does it mean that Jesus descended into hell? Okay. Well, we, we have our catechetical, which is actually an archetypal. It's not literal. Well, we have an archetypal understanding of this, which we take literally, which is this. That's the way I was catechized, and many of you were too. Today, a lot of people haven't been catechized at all on this. But this is the way we were catechized. Okay, It's not that it's false. It's just we, it's not literal. And they said this, God made Adam and Eve. God puts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Paradise. Okay, And then they're never supposed to die, but they're not supposed to eat from this tree. So they do. It's the original sin, the fall, okay? And then God puts Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Paradise, and they get the curses, one of which is mortality. Now they have to die, they have to work. There's going to be dominance of human beings and all the things, thistles are going to grow in place of wheat and so on, dandelions in your lawn, that's all from the first curse, okay? okay. <laughs> Snakes crawling in their bellies and so on. And see, and then the whole idea is the gates of heaven are shut, by the time Adam and Eve do this thing and they're tossed out of prayers, the gates of heaven are shut and they can't be opened until Jesus comes and dies. See, the Messiah comes and dies and then he opens up the gates of heaven. But you ask yourself, well, where were all those people? Sarah and Abraham and Rachel, all these, Moses. Well, they said they were in Hades. <laughs> they were in some underworld place, kind of asleep, and they were waiting for this great thing to happen. And those of you who say the four-volume breviary, just look up on Easter Saturday, Holy Saturday in the morning. There's a magnificent homily. It's a work of art, you know. It's like an icon. And this guy is describing how this happens. Jesus dies. And then after Good Friday, between Good Friday and Easter Sunday, see, he goes to those place, that place, and he takes these souls into heaven. And this artist describes, like, Jesus is waking up Adam, and Adam's rubbing mud over his eyes, not sure what's happening, and so on, and all this. And, and he leads them all triumphantly into heaven. Okay, 
Well, that's, that's an icon to meditate. It's not literal. The same as saying that we're washed by the blood of the lamb. Jesus wasn't a sheep. He wasn't a lamb. You never had blood spilled on you. It's not that those things aren't true. They're true in a different way. Okay. So what does it mean that Jesus descended into hell? Well, see, in our catechetical understanding, we said during the time between his death on Good Friday and resurrection Easter Sunday, he went to that place where Abraham and Sarah and all his people were, and he took him into heaven. Incidentally, the Mormons also think he visited America, Utah, during that time. So he, he, he had a busy time of it, you know, in Utah, you know. At least they'd have gone to California or something, but, you know. Okay, what does it mean? This is actually the most, this, this is, it's spiritual doctrine. It's this. I'm going to give you three frames in your, brief frames in your head. Take each one discreetly and then push them together and you got it. Just the first frame, okay. You can write your own. Some years ago, some very good friendly friends of mine in Edmonton had a daughter, 21 years old, with a history of clinical depression, and she attempted suicide. She was going to college. They flew her home, and then for three months, they took her to psychiatrists, to doctors. They rallied around her. The family tried to love her, tried to bring her out of this state she was in, and they couldn't. Three months later, she killed herself. See, she had descended into some space inside of herself, you know, some depressive, it might have even been biochemical, but some state in which no human being, no psychiatry, no love, no medicine could penetrate. Okay, close that frame. Second frame. If you ever go to London, England, go to the Anglican Cathedral, the Episcopalian Cathedral, St. Paul's Cathedral, and inside of that, there Vatican, there's a very famous painting by Holman Hunt. You've seen knockoffs of this painting. It's the Jesus who knocks. You've seen this, you know, so you have this, this beautiful painting and you have, there's a man behind a, a locked door and it's an oak door. It's about as thick as this, this podium, you know? And he's obviously depressed, he's huddled. And on the outside, Jesus is standing with a lantern and Jesus is knocking on the door to come in, obviously to heal this man, but there's only a doorknob on the inside. See, so the idea is Jesus wants to come in, but you got to open that door, okay? Now, third frame, go to John chapter 20, you know, in John's gospel, okay. And it's Jesus' first resurrection appearance. Well, he appears to Mary Magdalene, but then when he appears to the community, John describes it this way. He said, they were all inside of a room with the door locked out of fear. They were there and they were afraid and they were huddled inside of this room. They said, and Jesus came and he went right through the locked door and he stood in the middle and he breathed out. The last time you saw it is the very first line of scripture. In the beginning was the formless void, the chaos, and God breathed. <sighs> Ruah, Yahweh. He breathed out, then land began to separate from, from water, light from darkness. See, that breath, the breath of God, which the Holy Spirit stills to chaos. He breathed, and then he says, peace be with you. I'll say it again, peace. Now, put the three frames together. This young woman that descended to some kind of private hell into which this side of eternity, nobody could enter, okay? You can be sure when she woke up on the other side, Christ was in the middle, breathing out, saying, peace, peace be with you. See, what this doctrine teaches, why it's so consoling, you know? And those of you who read Hans Urs from Balthazar, it's one of the powerful parts of it. You know, Gregory of Nyssa, many great saints have written on this, you know? Um, when we can't help ourselves, we can get into all kinds of private hells and sometimes communal hells out of which we can't get. We can't help ourselves to communal things. Christ can help us. We can die in anger. We can die in suicide. We can die in a hundred different ways and so on. And we're sometimes, or we, where we're just alien. We, we can't help ourselves. God can get there. And see, God can go inside of hell itself and breathe out peace. We need that doctrine because all of us, sometimes we can't help ourselves. And we know people have died in all kinds of tragic, humanly tragic situations, you know, don't even fear for their salvation, you know. Uh, we couldn't help them. They couldn't help themselves. God can help us. That's the ultimate part of the doctrine of grace. You don't have to do it, you know. 
we're supposed to do as much willpower and stuff that, you know, we're called to cooperate, but sometimes we can't do it. This young girl, for all kinds of reasons, she couldn't help herself anymore. And for all kinds of reasons, nobody on this side of eternity could either. She was a wonderful, deep, sensitive soul. She's in heaven, you know, because um, Christ can be sent into there. See, it, it's the ultimate consoling doctrine. You know, it's interesting in, in Judaism and Islam, which are religions of grace, you get things that approximate this. And maybe it's my Christian bias, but nowhere else do you get something that's that explicit. So the next time you see the, see the creed, and you say, he descended into hell. Think, God, it's beautiful. <laughs> he, he's not going to Hades to wake up souls. That means, you know, the loved ones who are alienated from you and those hard points inside of you where you just cannot open your heart and it's cold, it's bitter, you can't forgive somebody, um, nobody can get in there anymore, and your therapist can't get there anymore, and your priest can't get there anymore, and you can't get there anymore. Uh, Jesus gets there, you know. He goes through locked doors. You know, what's wrong with Holman Hunt's painting? It's beautiful, it's haunting. My mother always gave us all holy cards with that on. Jesus is at your door knocking, okay? Um, except you don't have to open the door. It's good if you can, um, but God can come through locked doors. And in John's gospel, since Thomas wasn't there and didn't believe it, he came back a week later and did it again. So it's to show that um, it's a trick Jesus can do more than once, okay? <laughs> Okay, we have about 10 minutes left and if we get our, our runners with microphones and so on. But that's grace. Next week I want to look at uh, kind of an anthropology of this. This is looking at from scripture point of view. Next week I'll look from a human point of view. Early on in your lecture you said that uh, grace was part of community. Yeah. And no, I community was, is part of grace. Community is part of grace. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Can you speak to the relationship between Jesus' final words, it is finished, with grace and rest? Okay, that, that's a very good question. You know, Jesus' words, it is finished, okay? You know, I, I was once invited, which was actually a wonderful experience, that there's, a, there's different churches that on Good Friday, they always have some speaker will come in and they, they spend hours and stuff, and you do the seven last phrases of Jesus, and one of them is finished. It's finished, you know. Um, now, we use that expression in many ways. It's finished, you know. You finished your thesis. Or sometimes at night, you're just finished, you know. Or you've had a drip, look at the bottle of scotch. It's finished. <laughs> yeah. Remember earlier I said, I thirst and so on. But see, th th that, that's um, a phrase where Jesus, is, it's, it's the completeness of his life. See, it's... it's um, you know, not just Jesus can say it. Sometimes you look at a life um, of somebody who's really been a good person and their life is full. I mean, they lived into the 90s or whatever and they, they die with their family there and they're holding their hand and they've done a good life. They can say, it's finished. It's finished, you know. My project, my life, and so on. See, oftentimes, sadly, you know, one of the hard things about dying often is our life isn't finished. There's things you want to finish, and you don't want to see your grandkids. You're going to finish this. You're going to finish that, and so on. And 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 oftentimes we, what Eddie Helson calls the interrupted life. You know, it's it's uh, there's so much we'd still like to do, and, and 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 our life isn't full. You know, but it's Jesus' way of saying my mission. You know, and my attempt to hang on to grace in the garden, my attempt to forgive my enemies, all this stuff that I taught, I did it. You know. Uh, Paul, you know, you can say the race is finished, it's complete. Um, you know, there's nothing left to do anymore. Um, it's finished. You know, uh, I've seen that in, uh, you know, my own oldest brother died a couple of weeks ago. He was 85, surrounded by his kids. He had a great life. He was comfortable. He was finished. You know, he'd like to have lived longer and seen more of his great grandkids and so on, but he had a complete life. He knew it and so on. And, uh, Actually, at his funeral, I told his kids and grandkids, his, his name was Edwin. I said, you know, you've had a good example. I said, you can't all mo do Mother Teresa, but you can do him, you know. And his oldest son came over and said, it's not that easy to do him either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See, he could say, it's finished. Ho hopefully, you know, even, even when we're dying young sometimes, hopefully he say, it's finished. 
you know, there, there's things that still, like, everybody wants to do more with their life. But, you know, and Jesus that was 33, although in 33 in those years is probably like 60 or 70 now, you know, because the average age was probably 40. Incidentally, someone just put this on the internet the other day that from 18 and 18, 18, pretty much 1918 to now, 100 years, 100 years ago in 1918, the average lifespan for a man in the United States was 47 years, you know. Um, at 47, it's harder to say it's finished, <laughs> you know, but it, it's, he's speaking there of completeness and kind of um, uh, having done his vocation. He did what he was asked to do. I loved your presentation tonight, but I'd like to pose this problem. In 1517, in the Reformation, the Catholics were per per perceived as the willpower, and the Protestants were con perceived as grace. After 500 years, what progress have we made? <laughs> you know, it's a very good question. <clears throat> Incidentally, that, that, that tension between grace and willpower you can trace it out first. It's back. It's in the New Testament itself. That's the tension between James and Paul. See, St. Paul, and notice, it, it, you know, uh, Luther came very much out of St. Paul. Catholics have always really valued St. James. And remember, St. Paul and St. James, if you lay them together, it sounds like they're contradicting each other. Remember where Paul says it's not through works. It's through faith alone. And James says... Um, Faith without works is completely empty. He said, I'll show you my faith in my works, you know. Now, the misunderstanding there is that they're talking about works of the law. I mean, or Paul is talking about works of the law, and James is talking about charity and good deeds and so on. So it's actually an, an artificial misunderstanding there. Incidentally, in the person who academically did the most important work, and that was Hans Kung. He wrote his doctoral thesis on that. And, um, and really clarify that the way nobody else had before. <clears throat> but then it came through, um, now you're Irish, you know. Pelagius was Irish and St. Augustine at the Fourth Council of Carthage. And, um, and a lot of Irishmen today still believe that Pelagius got crucified because he was Irish. And they sided with, with Augustine. I know an Irish guy, by the I'm calling my first son Pelagius teach Rome they won't crucify an Irishman and get away with it and so on you know but see again see Pelagius was one of these people who, who was strong he had lived this clean life and so on he said no we, we need to do this and Augustine as you know had a pretty checkered history and had some sex addictions and so on said you can't do this except through grace but the church sided with grace but then afterwards at the time of the Reformation the Catholic Church um, we had lost our moorings a little bit. We had pretty well, you know, Luther was uh, an important challenge and, and correction. See, at that time, we were selling indulgence and doing a lot of nonsense where you could, you know, it was, you were saving yourself, so to speak. And so Luther, who was an Augustinian monk, notice he's coming out of Augustine, okay? So Luther put this strong, strong emphasis on um, exaggerated emphasis, the same as the Catholics were exaggeratedly into works. Now, to your question, today, happily, happily, that the theological problem is no longer a source of tension. Catholic theologians and scripture scholars and Protestant theologians and scripture scholars, that they don't have a lot of tension over this and so on. But happily, what's happened is that the Catholics have become more Protestants and the Protestants have become more Catholic. No, really, that's true. So happily there's been a rapprochement, as the French say, so that um, in many ways, the same thing as we used to have a lot of tension between what's more important, um, sacraments or the word, catechesis or Bible and so on. Today, Catholics have become much more literate in the Bible, much more important than the word, and Protestants have become much more sensitive to sacrament to, and so on, so that um, one of the wonderful things that's happened you know, in the last 50 to 70 years is that um, a lot of the, the artificial tensions, theologians have, and scripture scholars have been able to, to, to really bring a lot of this together. So they realized these were historical and other misunderstandings, you know. Um, 
you know, I have a friend of mine, a wonderful Protestant minister, and he writes and he, he always says, you know, um, your brother separated through 500 years of historical misunderstanding. <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but happily today, um, we, are, we, we have taken the challenge of Protestantism and taken it wonderfully, and so we understand justification, we understand grace uh, better than we did before. It's not we didn't, and vice versa. Protestantism has picked up a lot on, they no longer take James out of their Bible, which they used to, you know. James was kind of inconvenient to have in the Bible, you know. We didn't take Paul out of the Bible, we just didn't read him. <laughs> okay. Okay, it's nine o'clock. Okay, Derek, you're gonna get one last question here, okay. Mahatma Gandhi, having read the uh, Beatitudes of St. Matthew's Gospel, he goes to a church and then he sees people are seated according to their caste. And then he says, I love Christ, but not Christians. So in our journey towards the spirituality of willpower and grace, what kind of a spiritual paradigm that we can have commonly with other cultures, religions to share? Uh, okay, Gary, it's a good question, it's a big one. Um, but what you're pointed to is, is our, our own, and I say it sympathetically, that we've never really been faithful to the gospel. See, the gospel, say, and Gandhi was right, that shouldn't happen, you know. And remember, it's even, it's in the, in, in, in the New Testament, I think Paul says, you treat people, a rich man comes, you show him his place, a poor guy, sit him in the corner, and so on. Uh, that's anti-gospel. Now we do it, uh, and it's hard not to do. It's, 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 you know, it sounds so simple, but you know, when, uh, um, to our chapel, imagine in the morning, you know, um, uh, let's just name somebody, you know, uh, Tim Duncan walks into church. We're going to treat him with a little reverence. <laughs> we're going to say, we're going to get you a nice place to sit here, you know. Some of the street people come in and say, eh, you know, you might want to sit at the back and so on. It's, it's not that we're so much more advanced than the Christians of Paul's time. It's just, it's human nature. But the gospel is supposed to correct human nature, you know. And uh, so we still do it. We still do it. Uh, I do it. We all do it, you know. Um, you get some huge celebrity walking to church on Sunday, you know. There's deference, you know. And the street people walk in, you kind of discreetly try to move them out, you know. Um, so... That's human nature, but the gospel is meant to be a corrective of human nature. Anyway, thank you all for coming. It's 9 o'clock. Thank you.